We have been talking about uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, since uh, January of this year. And uh, Lord willing, today is the last sermon in this series. Uh, and I've really enjoyed this series because I don't have to think about what I'm going to preach. Uh, but everything else about it I have found difficult. Uh, I have found it difficult to explain, and I have found it personally challenging to follow. Um, because what Jesus teaches here in these three chapters is a compressed form of what it means to follow after him. What it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a follower of Jesus. What it means to be a part of the kingdom of God is explained in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And it is a very challenging lifestyle. And by studying this, I hope that it's been clear that Jesus teaches in a very plain, very straightforward manner, but the standards that he calls us to are extremely high. And so we've come to the end. Last week we talked about the conclusion where Jesus begins to, to sum everything up and where he talks about, uh, about not just trying to follow him in word where people say they follow him, but they don't do what he says. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And he talks about following him in word, but not in, in spirit. Now, his final section, the last three verses, four verses, verses 24 through 27 of Matthew chapter 7, we can almost call an invitation. But it's not exactly an invitation, certainly not an invitation like we think about in, in the modern preaching that I've always heard. But here's where Jesus really presents it as another choice. He presents a choice to every person who's ever lived. And he does it in the most simple illustration. Our youngest children, children who have barely learned to talk, sing a song based on this very simple illustration. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. Everybody can understand that. But that's how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. I want to point out just a couple of things to you before we read this passage here in Matthew chapter 7. Mainly, that Jesus here is just giving you the, the one way to be safe in life. If you look at what he says here at the very beginning of verse 24 and also in verse 26, he says, He who hears these words of mine can be compared to a man. Verse 26. He who hears these words of mine and acts on them. Verse 26 is, He who hears these words of mine and does not act on them. And so when Jesus brings his entire sermon to a conclusion, to its final plea, here's what he says. There's two, two ways you can go. You can act on what I've said, or you cannot act on what I've said. That's what he's talking about here. So let's look and see how he illustrates it. Verse 24. Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And it fell. And great was its fall. That's the end. The last thing he says. No passionate plea. No emotional exhortation. Just, here's your choice. You can act on my words, or you cannot act. Here's the future for the two groups. There's only two groups. And here's the future. Notice there's really only one place of safety. There's only one place where you're not going to be destroyed. 
destroyed. It's in that house built on the rock. The house built on the sand, and if you're anywhere else, you're destroyed. That's what Jesus says. He says, I've told you the truth. He's not making this emotional plea for you to follow the truth. He's saying, I've told you the truth, and now it's up to you. Now it's up to you. You think about the house here. Jesus is obviously talking about our lives. When he says, the one who acts on my words versus the one who does not act on my words, he's talking about how you live your life. And he says, acting on my words is a foundation. Every other foundation is useless. Let's talk about the wise man. Let's talk about him first. Verse 24, the wise man hears these words of mine, acts on them. He's compared to the wise man who built his house on the rock. This symbolizes everyone specifically. Look, if you look at what he says there in verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine. Here is part of the beauty of the message of Jesus. Anybody can hear his word and anybody can act on it. It doesn't require any special characteristic on your part. It doesn't require any special talent, any special gift, any special opportunity. Hear these, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. Everyone can hear the word. It's on the responsibility of the church to make sure that everyone does hear the word. Everyone has an opportunity to act on the word. And then anybody can act on it. It's area. Jesus says, what I have taught you here applies to everybody. For all time. But remember that it's not easy. A similar passage, probably when Jesus preached a very similar sermon recorded in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. In the Gospel of Luke, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. They're very, very similar. Probably preached at two different times in two different places. But where Jesus has mainly the same message. Well, in this section of the Sermon on the Plain from Luke chapter 6, in verse 46, Luke records it this way. Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Now, in Matthew 5, it says, Not everyone who says to be Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And Luke, it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house. Notice how he describes it here. Who dug deep and laid a foundation. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. You see, in Luke, Jesus paints a little bit more specific picture. In Matthew, he says, he built his house on the rock. In Luke, he says, he had to dig down deep until he found the rock. And then he built there, as opposed to the foolish man who just built, built on the top. Jesus is saying very clearly that building your life on the foundation of his word is not easy. It takes effort. It takes focus. It takes passion. It takes drive. It takes determination. It takes perseverance. Right? It's not easy. It doesn't come easily. And anytime somebody teaches you that following Christ, that being faithful to Christ comes with no sacrifice, comes with no effort, comes with no difficulty, they're not telling you what Jesus taught. They're not teaching you what Jesus taught because that's not what he teaches. But look at the promise here and the illustration of the wise man. Jesus says the rain fell, the winds blew, the floods hit that house, and it did not fall. Guess what? The wise men the people who build their lives on the foundation of Jesus' word, they go through storms. The rain falls on their house too. The floods hit the side of their house, even hit the foundation of their house. The winds slam against the house, even of the people who follow Jesus. Everybody goes through storms. Here's Jesus' promise, I'll save you. I will keep you secure. I will keep you safe if you build your life 
on the foundation of my word. If you will act on what I have taught you, if you will not just listen to it, if you will not just say you'll follow it, if you will not just say you believe in me, but if you'll do it, if you'll act on it, if you will adopt and develop these characteristics in yourself, if you will follow this narrow path that I have laid out for you, I will take care of you. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Paul says, but in all these things, he's, he's gone through a list of difficulties. He says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing will take you away from God's love and God's protection if you will build your life on the foundation of his word, if you will act on his word. Jesus says that this is the love of God, that true love for God is doing what God said. John chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus said, I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. The salvation that Jesus brings is not just through the storms of life here on earth. It's eternal. He's saying, I will keep you through the storm of death. I will keep you through the storm of grief. I will keep you through the storm of judgment. I will keep you through the storm of standing before the judgment seat of the almighty creator of the universe. Eternal divine justice, you'll be saved if you will act on my word. That's a promise. When you think about these storms that you face, storms where you now. We had storms here a few weeks ago. We talked about that. And we've had a few much more minor storms. And there's still cleanup going on. If you go out and you help pile brush or cut down trees and get stuff off of people's houses, you'll come home and you'll be tired. If you drive over there to East Brainerd and College Dale, you'll be overwhelmed with the amount of destruction. Overwhelmed with the amount of loss. And you're just like, oh. This will never be done. The city's like, we can't pick up all the brush because it's still out on the trees, out on the, it hasn't been cut and piled up. It just feels like it's never going to be over. Does your life ever feel like that? Oh, whatever. And when is this going to end? Our children have been finishing up school virtually and starting to take tests and final exams. I remember being in school, oh, is this ever going to end? It ends. But storms do that to you. Storms wear you out. They make you tired. They make you afraid. They make you want to quit. Right? Jesus says, stay in this house built on this rock. Stay in the life founded on my word. I'll get you through it. I'll get you through it. That's a promise. It's a beautiful thing. So whatever your storm, whether it be financial academic, or health, or marital, or relationship, or social, or whatever. Act on his words. Stay in that house built on the rock. And you'll be saved. No storms will destroy you. But there's another side. And that's the foolish man. If you look back here, verses 26 27, Jesus says, Whoever, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them. Notice the similarities. The similarities between the foolish man and the wise man are almost 100%. They both hear the words. They hear the same words. A lot of commentators have said that this really pictures people, much like the previous verses where Jesus talks about people who call me Lord, Lord, and people who think they're following Christ, people who say they're following Christ, people who call Jesus Lord, they hear the word of God. A lot of people have said that means people who are 
actively studying. They're going to church. They're part of a group that is a church. And they participate in spiritual things. And they, they read spiritual material. They hear the word. The word gets into their ears and into their mind. This is not people who keep the word of Christ at arm's length. These people hear the word. Well, this foolish man built a house. And I think the implication is that from the outside, the house looks the same. They both build a house and you can't tell the difference. They both go through the same storms. They both see the rain. They both see the flood. They both see the wind. They feel those things beating against their house. They're in exactly the same position. The only difference is the foolish man does not act on it. The foolish man doesn't really take the word and allow it to change his behavior. The foolish man doesn't really take the word and allow it to become the thing that he never leaves. He doesn't stay on that foundation and stay there no matter what. He's like, yeah, I hear the word, but I think I would like to go over there. I'll listen to the word, but I really kind of want to do it this way. I want to do it my way. And quite frankly, you see that a lot in religion. You see a lot of people in religion who claim to believe the Bible and who claim to follow the Bible, but then when you point out how they're not following the Bible, they say, well, I believe it's better this way. Yeah, you do. Because you're building your life on your foundation rather than on the foundation of the Word of Christ. You hear the Word, you claim to follow Christ, but you've actually built on another foundation. Well, guess what? The storm's coming. The storm's coming. And it's not until the storm comes that you see the difference between the two houses. It's only when the storm gets here that you see the danger of the foolish man's approach. The fact of the matter is that Jesus teaches over and over again the necessity of obedience. I'll give you an example. James chapter 1, verse 22. The brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus, biologically, says this, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If the word of God isn't changing you, if you if you look in the Word of God and you don't see anything about you that needs to change, if you look in the Word of God and you do see things in you that need to change, and then you walk away from the Word of God and nothing changes, well, you're like the person in James chapter 1. He looks in the mirror and he says, oh, I look perfect. Yeah, I got bad head and, you know, my face is dirty, but I'm going to stay the way I am. Or he looks in the mirror and he says, Oh, I need to comb my hair. I need to wash my face. And then he leaves and he doesn't wash his hair. He doesn't comb his hair. He doesn't wash his face. That's what James 1 is describing by a person who looks at the word of Christ, but it has no effect on them. It has no effect on how they behave. It has no effect on what they do. The Bible doesn't set forth. Jesus never calls for people to find a set of rules in his word and to follow all these rules and that's how you go to heaven. That is simply not how it works. The way Jesus presents it is if you love God and if you love me then you will trust that we know what's best, we know what's right and you'll do what we've said. And if you're not doing it if you are rejecting what we said if you're doing what you want to do, and you don't really love us, and you don't really trust us. There's a lack of love, and there's a lack of faith. I want you to see, go with me to John chapter 14. Go look at several different verses, pretty close to each other, but we're just going to pull them out because we don't have time to go through the detail. Several different verses where Jesus talks about the connection between love 
and obedience. You see, obedience, according to Jesus, is not a list of rules that you just follow because if you don't, then you're going to be punished and the big axe is going to come down. There's a totally different motivation the way Jesus teaches it. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Down to verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Down to verse 31. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. You see what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, I do what God says, not because I'm afraid that he will punish me. I do it because I love him. Because I want to do what he wants done. Because he is everything to me. And he says, and if I mean something to you, if Jesus means something to you, you will respond in the same way to his word. Come down to chapter 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. How do you abide in Christ? How do you abide in God? By loving them enough to trust what they said and do it. Chapter 15, verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. You see, it's easy to turn Christianity into a cold set of do this and don't do that. A cold set of rules, do this and don't do that. It's, it's about a relationship. But it's not a relationship like we have with a spouse or like we have with a friend. It's a relationship with the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. It's about a relationship with an eternal God who is all-powerful and all-knowing and ever-present and transcendent and unchanging. And, and we are none of those things. We are limited. We have very brief lifespans. We have very limited knowledge and ability to understand. We have very small realms of influence. But our very small limited selves are allowed a relationship with this infinite creator. But if our limited selves are going to have a relationship with this infinite creator, it's got to be on the basis of our love for him in response to his love for us. But if our response to his love for us is to say, okay, now, God, I want you to do everything my way and let me be the leader, that's not love. And so that's why Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll stay in my word. If you love me, you'll do what I said, the way I do what my father says, because I love him. Because if you really understand the person, the being in whom you're with whom you're in a relationship, doing what they said is the only thing that makes sense. And to refuse to do what they said is the ultimate disrespect and rejection. It's intolerable. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Here you see the connection between obedience, love, and faith. And I love this verse, uh, the end of verse 3. His commandments are not burdensome. It really hurts it, it really makes me sad when I hear people complaining about what the Word of God says, what the Word of God asks them to do. And they talk about it like it's a burden, like it's unfair, like it makes life worse. It doesn't make life worse. It makes life better. It's not easy to follow. It's not without difficulty. And it comes with storms. You, can, you have storms either way. And maybe in some ways you have even more storms following Jesus. You certainly get some attacks. But the commandments are not burdensome because they are the method. 
that God leads us through the storms. They are the method that God uses to protect us and to keep us safe. And so he says, this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And who overcomes the world? But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe that Jesus is a divine being who predated his own birth, the, the agent through whom the world and the universe were created, well, believing that demands a certain response. It demands an obedience. It demands a respect. It demands an honor. It demands an absolute submission to him. And so loving him and believing in him automatically produce a devotion to what he says. A desire to do what he says. And so that's why, verse 3, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And so obedience and love are two sides of the same coin really a three-sided coin because faith is one side too. But over and over again in the New Testament, obedience and love for God and love for Christ are presented as the same. And that's what Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount with. Act on my words and I'll take care of you. I will protect you. And so we see a radical choice. I want you to think back through just a few of the lessons that we've studied in the Sermon on the Mount. If you go back to Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, you have eight Beatitudes. And these Beatitudes are countercultural. They go against what we see in every society for all time, including our own today, where he talks about us being poor in spirit and seeing ourselves as needy. He talks about the blessing of mourning. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. And so that's the mindset. That is the foundation of what it is to be a Christian. And then he starts to build on top of that. And he talks about how the world is like rotting food. Bacteria is causing its destruction. He says, you are the salt of the earth. He says, you're different from the world. You stop the decay that is in the world by following me, by having these attitudes. The world is full of darkness and ignorance and gloom. He says, you are the light of the world. You bring truth. You bring hope. You bring light to the world. You are different from it. You are salt. You are light. You are different from the world. And he starts talking about the word. And he starts talking about how none of the word is going to, it's all going to be fulfilled. And then he starts correcting the word. And he starts correcting misinterpretations of the word about hate and about love. And he teaches us an attitude. He teaches us a righteousness that's different from just cold rule keeping because it reaches to our heart. It reaches into our inner soul. It becomes something that consumes us and envelops us. And so our giving, our praying, our fasting are from, are from devotion to God and are looking for nothing from any other person because this devotion and this faith grows from our heart. And so we choose service over money. We choose piety over power. We choose fellowship over pain. Fellowship over fame. And so then, Matthew 7, he brings it all to a head. Whatever, however you want people to treat you, you treat them. He sums it all up. However you want people to treat you, you treat them. And then his conclusion, there's a small gate to a narrow path, and there's a broad gate to a wide way. You get to choose. You get to choose. And it doesn't really matter whether you say you follow me. It doesn't really matter if you tell people you follow me and even do things that are supposed to be in my best interests if you're not really following me, if you're not changing your behavior and adapting your thoughts your wants and your feelings 
for my word. And then he sums it up with a choice. He's like, you can act on my words or you can not act on my words. That's the only thing that's going to matter. If you act on my words, you'll be saved through every storm and I'll protect you. If you don't act on my words, for whatever reason, you'll be destroyed. That's the future of every person. It's the future of you. It's the future of me. It's the future of our children. the future of everybody who's ever lived and will ever live. And we get to choose. We get to choose whether or not we're going to build our lives on the foundation of his word. Very simple. We do what he says because we love him. choosing wrong, if you have been choosing incorrectly, or if you have never chosen to build your life on the foundation of Christ and to entrust your soul to Him, we would love to help you in doing that. Although we can't do anything right here in the room together, whatever needs to be done, we will do as quickly as it can be done. So if you're ready to come to Christ, if you're ready to follow what his instructions are about how you receive salvation and become a part of his kingdom for the first time, putting him on in baptism, or if you need help with some other spiritual problem, if you need to, to make public confession or to, to express public repentance or you need prayers for whatever problem you may be having, whatever we can do, we would love to help you if you'll just reach out to us and let us know in some way.